Welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining the fifth edition of uh, Conversations with Green Changemakers in Japan. So the goal of the talks is really to bring along passionate individuals to talk about various topics around ecology and uh, well-being. And so today we are very lucky to be welcoming uh, our guest speaker Chuck Kaiser from uh, Midori Farm. So uh, to tell you a bit more about Chuck, so he's from the US and he has been living in Japan actually for over 20 years, mostly in, to in Kyoto. Uh, so he began growing uh, vegetables in the mountains of Shiga 12 years ago. And uh, this started as a hobby, but quickly turned into a, a real passion for him. And he has established Midori Farm a few years ago to start selling his uh, vegetables and also host volunteers, run some tours and events to educate uh, a bit more about uh, this, uh, this topic. On top of that, he has also co-founded Seeds of Sustainability Kyoto in 2017 to host events in uh, Kyoto City around you know, uh, the topic of sustainability. He will tell a bit more about uh, his story, how he started Midori Farm. We will also discuss quite a bit uh, about organic farming uh, in Japan. So um, I hope you will enjoy the, the chat. Uh, so just to start a little bit, can you tell us a bit more when you started realizing and became aware of the climate change and how did you start, you know, how did this uh, impact your ecological transition? Climate change is something like, um, it's a hard thing to track, like when I actually started figuring it out, um, that it was happening because um, it's clearly been happening for a long time. And when I was a kid in the Chicagoland area, you know, we would get two, three foot of snow um, in the winter. And then sometimes now there's almost no snow. And, you know, so it's something that you think about later. Um, and so as when it's, I really figured it out, I can't really say, but I think the largest impact it's had for me is because as I'm farming and I'm spending lots and lots of time outdoors and in the mountains of Shiga, um, for listeners who don't know where that is, that's a prefecture north of Kyoto City. Actually, it's east of Kyoto. Um, but we go to the north of Kyoto City to get there. And it's in the mountains, so it's, it's a lot of snow. I mean, there's often a meter of snow on the ground since I've been starting going there for about 17 years ago. And I've watched it just get less and less. And that was probably the biggest tipper for me that watching the snows get so much less because I not only have a farm there, but I also have a small home, a little house, a little mountain house, and uh, I have people up for sledding. And I've been doing that for 15 years. And last year we couldn't do it because there wasn't enough snow. And it was like, what? Usually we get over a meter of snow for three or four months. So I'd have to say that was probably the biggest indicator for me um, that climate change was real and uh, happening. Mm, makes sense. So it's through your farming activity that almost you realize that because you are closer with nature. It so makes sense. Exactly. Um, and of course, working on the farm, it's, it's been even more, more impactful to my lifestyle because, oh, we can't go sledding. That's disappointing. But um, the facts that, um, you know, farmers rely on frost dates, um, which means when is the first frost of the year? Is it going to be November 2nd? Is it going to be December 14th? You know, is it going to be in January? Is it way back in September? When is it going to go below zero degrees uh, Celsius or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit? So farmers know when to plant stuff so it doesn't die off. And then, of course, when is the last frost date? Uh, is it March 22nd? Is it April 3rd? Is it sometime in June? Is it sometime in January? We have to know these things. So again, our plants don't die. Um, and this has been the big sliding truth. Uh, we can't figure that stuff out now because it changes too fast. And I talk to the old farmers in the valley and they say, oh, you plant your daikon on this day. It's no problem. And then they, you know, suddenly it's like, nope, not anymore. So that has been the most uh, impactful thing for Midori Farm as far as climate changes, the lengthening of the growing season. 
Mm-hmm. So, and when to plant, when to stop planting, and will things overwinter, and can I now start growing onions, because I couldn't before, um, but now maybe I can, because the snows aren't so heavy. So, things like that have a strong effect on farmers all over the world. And so, for everyone who thinks, oh, no, climate change is getting too hot, just imagine if that's your office. You know, you can't turn on the air conditioning on the farm, so... It's a really huge uh, thing for farmers all over the world to have to deal with climate change. Yeah. Uh, I understand actually your background is more in teaching. So can you tell us a bit more why and how you started growing vegetables and what's the story of Midori Farm? Uh, I, Midori Farm was a name that started about three years ago when I decided to reorganize my farming activities. About five or six years ago I was with the name OK Fields and that was my first attempt to kind of organize my farming activities into something with events and sales and before that it was just me for seven or eight years going out there by myself fiddling in the dirt and hoping I get something Um, and so what as you said in the introduction and thank you for such a nice introduction uh, it just started as a hobby and really quickly turned into a passion um, I wanted to just build a house in the, in the mountains and my friends who lived there said, okay, we'll help you look for a place to buy. And they found a small piece of land. The landowner and I got together. We agreed on a price. We went to the town office and it was a very old deed, you know, the, the form, the paper for the piece of land. And it had to be redone. It had to be rezoned, which was very expensive. So I couldn't buy it or I could, but it was just much more expensive than I wanted to spend. So I said, no, I'm, I can't buy it. And the landowner felt really bad because we'd gone through this whole process. And he said, Chuck, why don't you just use it as a farm? You know, that's what my wife was doing until she died. I mean, this guy was 75, 80 at the time. And I said, I, have, I don't have any interest in farming. But my friends who helped me find the place who were living there, they said, Chuck, if you farm it, um, that's a good idea because then the local people will kind of get to know you. And I said, well, what does that matter? And they said, well, in Japan, in the Japanese mountains, in the countryside, often the case that this land has been in the family for generations, like 10 or 20 generations. So they don't just sell, you know, to just anybody. They need to know who the person is and trust them and know they're not a bad element. So that's why I started farming was because, I wanted to be known to the other people in the village so that they would offer me a piece of land for sale. And then I started and I failed miserably to derate all my vegetables the first year. Second year, I put up a fence. So I got some. I was like, yay. And the third year, I got good. And good. That's quotes. I got better. And I could actually feel like, ooh, this is interesting. And so then I forgot all about buying land and I just started farming. Yeah. And uh, I understood, so you said you started on your own, and now uh, you have like quite a few volunteers coming, you know, all around the, the year. Can you tell us about mm-hmm. the, the program you've started with uh, Midori Farm? Sure, sure, sure. That was that was uh, at the same time I started Midori Farm as a name. Three years ago, um, I had a friend of mine uh, build the website and the branding of it. And then it went live or it was launched or whatever. And then a a woman who'd just come to Kyoto from Canada found me and said, I want to buy your vegetables. I said, okay, come on over. And so she came over and she talked and she's like, I want to buy your vegetables and I want to visit your farm. I said, okay, I don't have anybody going out there. So that's fine. And she helped out. And then she said, Chuck, you need a volunteer program. I said, I don't know what that is. And it makes me feel scared, you know, because I don't trust people on my farm. And she said, no, 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 no. Let me sign you up as a workaway host. I said, what's workaway? And a lot of people may have heard of WOOF, um, which is used to be the, the abbreviation for willing workers on organic farms, but it's changed now. But that was like the, one of the original volunteer programs for people to go and help on organic farms. And it's got a long history and WorkAway came along much later, but it kind of modernized the system and made it much more accessible or something. This is all again from my friend who had been a WorkAway volunteer. And she said, WorkAway would probably be a little bit easier to do than WorkAway. So I said, okay, we'll do that. 
And so she set up the whole hosting web uh, description and uh, the profile on Workaway and away we went. And at first it was a rocky, you know, beginning and trying to get used to who's, who do we ask, who do we invite, who do we accept? And, but it's a pretty good program for people who don't know it. I'll, I'll back up a bit. The work away or Wolfing profile is great. The pro, uh, program is great. Hosts who are organic farmers, or actually there's other businesses that also sign up like guest houses and uh, schools and things like that who need volunteers. And then people who want to travel within their own country or to a foreign country can sign up as volunteers. And I think you have to pay a membership fee as a volunteer, not as a host, but as a volunteer. And then, for example, if you really wanted to go to Italy, but you don't have a lot of money, but you want to have a real unique experience, you could look, join Workaway and find, oh, you could go out and take care of somebody's kids in Napoli, or you could go to an organic farm in Venice, or you could go to a pizzeria in Rome. I mean, I don't know what there is, but you could have this sort of unique experience and kind of get in touch with some local people and also be able to stay and eat for free. So in, in exchange for five hours of work a day, five days a week. So a lot of people are doing this now. It's volunteerism and uh, it's wonderful. I mean, I've never been a volunteerist, but uh, being, being a host, I have met ah, 40 people or so who came, who've come from all over the world to volunteer on Midori Farm, staying from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And it's fantastic. It feels like I'm traveling because I get international people all the time and I get to meet so many different kinds of people and uh, introduce them to the Japanese countryside, organic farming, and kind of share some experiences with them. So mm. it's, it's a wonderful program. Yeah. I did that once and it was really amazing. I agree with you. Mm. Where, where did you go? Uh, Kyushu. Okay. Mm. What did you do there? Uh, planting, oh no, um, removing the bad uh, weeds from uh, rice fields. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good, really good. Nice. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, did you wear the tall white boots or did you? Were you no, barefoot? just uh, you barefoot. <laughs> oh, no, that's fun. That's fun. Yeah. That's great. Yes. Um, to go back a bit more about uh, your life as an organic farmer, so what are the challenges and the joys about being an organic farmer in Japan? How long is this interview? I don't think we have <laughs> enough time for those challenges. <laughs> I mean, I'll start with the joys. Um, it's amazing to be part of a, I mean, the work that I do or the work that organic farmers do um, is about as close to a natural system as you can get, as far as I can tell, at least as close as I've seen um, without, you know, you have to interfere a little bit, but at the same time, you have to cooperate with nature. Um, you can't fight the ocean. You have to surf and you have to swim and you have to get wrecked sometimes and you have to get back on the board and, I think that organic farming in a lot of ways is a lifestyle. It's, it's a philosophy. It's um, religion. I don't know. I don't have the right word for it, but it's, it's something completely different than any other occupation that I've ever had. And for me, it's really a true vocation. I feel a real calling um, to continue doing this um, for many reasons that I won't get into now, but um, it is such a joy to be part of something and doing something that is so beneficial and so necessary and so natural um, that I feel very lucky that this found me. I, again, I, as I said, I did not intend to be a farmer. I did not uh, study farming. I did not train as a farmer. I didn't, I never was a farmer in America. I just put some seeds in the ground in Japan and away I went. What a lucky break for me. I mean, really, that, my life is so much better for it. Now the challenge is now, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, let me let everybody out there know that monkeys suck. They are the worst things ever because they've got thumbs just like we do. 
and they they've got really sharp minds they work as a team and they figure stuff out they figure it out man i have gone through at least 20 different configurations of fences trying to keep them out yeah. No, no, these guys, oh my God, they are just insane. They, I mean, because they don't have Nintendo, they don't have Netflix, they don't have Uber Eats. <laughs> they got some roots and some bark in the mountains, and that's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, Chuck's got corn, and Chuck's got watermelon, and Chuck's got kabocha, and daikon, and cabbages, and broccoli, and wow, it's a smorgasbord let's go to Chuck's place. And they do. <laughs> they really, really do. And it's not just one or two cute little monkeys. It's 40 or 50 wow. that just clean me out in a couple hours. So that's probably the biggest challenge I've had is the large predator, not predators, I shouldn't say, large pests, such as uh, um, monkeys, crows, um, deer, um, things like this that get on the farm and really can do a lot of damage in a very short time. I mean, you can get everything right in farming, which is a lot to begin with. I mean, the timing, the watering, the weeding, the soil prep, the trellising, the everything. It's like, finally, tomorrow. And it's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just gone because something came along and took it away from you. And it's just like, <sighs> It's just so gutting and I've, I've been in tears and enraged and so many times and just on the, on the flip side, it, it, it's so nice because I've learned to deal with so many hardships and so much loss and so much devastation and I, through tears of anger and sadness, just been putting my sweet potato plants back into the ground after they've been yanked out for the third time. But still I go on. So I've, I've learned this tenacity. I've learned this perseverance. And I've learned to deal. You just deal. You know, you don't, you don't let it end you. You just deal with it and you move on. Because tomorrow is another day. And if you give up, then you're out. That's it. Nobody's going to do it for you. It's not going to get better unless you do it again. So I've learned that. Um, but aside from the large predators, I'd say insects are a major catastrophe on the farm. Today, we picked off 13 giant ho tomato hornworm caterpillars. For those of you who farm, you know what I'm talking about. These suckers, whoo, devastating. This big, I mean, literally, that's like a six inch caterpillar, which is what, like uh, 15 centimeters long about as big around as a cigar because why are they so big because they ate my eggplants yes oh. they that's how they got so big beautiful gorgeous caterpillars that turn into these lovely moths but no no oh, hell no get away you know so i was kind to them i brought the, i escorted them off the farm to the riverside i did not throw them in the river as uh, i could have <laughs> or i should have but i just put them down there and i was nice to them but I mean, honestly, Eileen, you hear about things like insect die off. Um, you hear about things like, you know, how important the insects are. So I, I'm in a tough spot. You know, they're killing my vegetables. Should I kill them? But it seems like I'm, I might be creating the last refuge for some of these insects, <laughs> you know, but that's, I, that doesn't, that's not why I'm doing it. Even the monkeys are adorable, all the little babies and the little deer. Oh, it's like, no, that's not why I'm doing it. You know, so I'm struggling with a lot of these issues because I do love nature. I do love animals and insects and things like that. I, I respect the environment so much and I, I really want to be a part of it, not in charge of it or, you know, dominating it. But that's not why I'm growing vegetables, you know, and so... <laughs> That's one of the major struggles is trying to manage the that balance. sort of, yes, the balance. It, it's striking the balance. And that's, that's organic farming from beginning to end is striking that balance inside and outside with everything. Yeah. Awesome. And so why do you feel it's so important to grow food organically and not eat food that have been sprayed with pesticides? Um... 
mainly for our own health and for the health of the environment. Um, because clearly pesticides are killing things. Um, and I use organic pesticides, but they're in, designed so that they only kill certain insects that are doing something like that are eating your vegetables or that are in a certain stage of their life. So it's very controlled. Um, but chemical pesticides are often not so safe for other things so that um, farmers often become ill themselves because they're handling these pesticides or breathing these pesticides or they're around these pesticides in minimal amounts every day so it builds up. And so it's really bad for everything, um, not only the people who are spraying them, but the people who are eating the vegetables and the people downriver from the farm because the pesticides are washed off the farm into the river and away you go. I mean, I grow in the mountains near several other farmers who do spray and I ask them not to and I do my best to cut their grass for them, but I'm not gonna be able to change an 80 year old man who's been doing something the same way for 50 years, you know, since the pesticide salesman came along and made it seem so great. So I think it's also kind of a shot in the arm for the old ways. And you have to think about the corporations that produce the pesticides. Um, if you're gonna go into a shop and buy something, you should think about, well, here's my money. I'm gonna vote for somebody with this money. I'm either gonna vote for Sony or RCA or something to buy electronics or Toyota or Chevrolet or Peugeot for an automobile or organic or non-organic in vegetables. And if you buy organic, you're suddenly not only voting for an organic farmer, but you're uh, not voting for not only the conventional farmer, but all the things a conventional farmer invests in, like the chemicals and things like that. So I think about it as a very simple, easy, everyday way for people to participate in being more environmental because you're suddenly supporting people who are environmental and you're not supporting people who are devastating to the environment. So I think it's very important for those reasons as well. Makes sense. And so can you tell us actually a bit more, if you know, like what is the situation in Japan in terms of, you know, maybe small organic farmers versus like the more corporate farms? Like what's the percentage or the proportion? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know from just personal experience, the number of small organic farmers is very low. Um, yeah, the number of farmers in Japan is very low for that matter. Um, I mean, for the past 50 years, Japan has been on a, a real decrease on the number of people who want to live the farming lifestyle. Um, so the people who do farm want to maximize their profits and farm in the conventional ways because Japan is a wonderful country, as, as you know. Um, everybody's in great harmony with one another and we all kind of get along and that's so great. But when you're getting along and going along with everyone and suddenly you see, well, this isn't such a healthy way to live or healthy way for a future or not very sustainable way because of the way that the corporations want us to farm, then you realize, well, that's not so good for us, but everybody else kind of goes along with it because that's what we're supposed to do. So in my mind, organic farming is still on the uptake in, in Japan. We we're still want to, we still need to get a foothold. We still need to kind of educate people about why, what is organic farming and why is it important? I mean, why wouldn't you spray chemicals? Why wouldn't you wrap in plastic? Why wouldn't you do things the way everybody else is doing it? Um, and it's funny because um, one of my favorite books is uh, Farmers of 40 Centuries. And it's written by F.H. King, uh, who is a professor about 100 years ago in America, who admits the devastation of agriculture in America at that time due to over farming and a lack of information on how to farm. He visited China, Korea, and Japan, took just really good notes. Uh, he, went, he didn't go to the cities, he went to the farms. He went to the small villages, the mountains, and he learned how people were farming. Had been farming for 4,000 years, and I mean, a country like China, 
Yeah, you can see how they'd get away with it. Massive country, lots of natural resources. Korea, it's, it's landlocked, so it's still, you know, a lot of connected. But how did Japan do it? How is Japan able to manage? Because the American way was just, oh, we farmed this area for five years. Corn doesn't grow anymore. Just move west. Just move west. And suddenly you get to the other ocean, you're like, what are we going to do now? And so he came and he learned about composting. He learned about all these wonderful organic ways. And he brought it back to America and saved American agriculture. And that's where organics has its roots is from some of his work. I mean, other people did their own studies and work as well. Credit be given to Rodale and people like that. But, you know, this was one of a monumental movements for agriculture in America. And now it's kind of on the reverse that Japan's sliding off into chemical horrors and, and infertile soil and runoffs and things like that. Whereas America's kind of ahead of the game with organics now. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping we can kind of turn that coin over and kind of give back and re-educate or ask the Japanese people to remember, hey, you used to do this all the time. You know, just remember what composting is like and remember what soil fertility means and crop rotation and not monocropping and things like that. And, you know, using the community to your benefit. And like you'd said, I use volunteers all the time and it's wonderful. People love coming to the farm. People love farming and helping and seeing the vegetables grow and learning about it. And everybody goes away with a smile on their face and a little sunburn on their nose and a little more information about how to pick their vegetables and how to respect the fact that that carrot took four months to grow. You know, it's not just poke, it pops out of the ground four months and it's not easy. So yeah, I think that um, it's really important that these things kind of move forward. But for now, small organic farmers in Japan are really in a vast minority. Yeah. I think what you are saying is totally right. Like the permaculture movement, I think, was inspired by Japan originally. So it's like going back again to the... the there way. you go. <laughs> yeah, because they always had ox, always had oxen. And that was part of the, 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 the process. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's one question actually, which is about uh, the organic uh, pesticides uh, you use. Does mm -hmm. this, you know, what are they, and you know, how does this impact uh, the the crops? Like, is it um, okay. harmless in a sense? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the simplest one is like an insecticidal soap, and those are basically made from things like uh, dish soap. I use an organic environmental dish soap anyway. So I use that because that kind of makes it stick to the leaves and actually just spraying soap and water on many insects like stink bugs, you know, or something like a stink bug thing that's eating your vegetables will most likely kill it. So that's a super easy thing to do. Um, and then some people add things like garlic and uh, red pepper and ginger and things like that to the, to the soap just to give it a little punch so that things are you know, deterred by that, like, oh, that's too stinky for me. I'm not going to eat that. That doesn't taste good. That doesn't smell good. Um, and some people boil onion skins and do that for the same sort of reason. So there's a lot of natural stuff like that. And if you go way back, people are even incorporating things like soot from the chimney uh, as an insecticide as well. But modern society, modern organic farming has really come a long way in the laboratory as well. And, um, oh, before I go into that, neem oil from India is fantastic. It's made from a nut, and it's just like peanut oil, except it's neem oil. And it is insanely stinky. Ooh. So that really does a lot for helping keep the insects away and for uh, protecting your vegetables. Um, so there's a lot of just all natural stuff that you can use. Um, and I've heard lots of different stories about that. But like things in the laboratory, there's something called Bacillus syringiensis, which is a naturally soil-borne uh, bacteria that exists, you know, naturally. And scientists have found a way to isolate it and grow it. And I don't know if it's freeze-dried or something, but you basically add it to water and reconstitute them, and they're alive again. And then you spray that on your vegetables. And there's different kinds of beet. It's called BT, Bacillus syringiensis, BT. There's different kinds of BT. The original one is basically made for caterpillars, and that's the one that's available in Japan. But there's also ones made for aphids and for other kinds of insects now. Because 
those are targeting only the insects that eat your crop. So they don't hurt the bees, they don't hurt the frogs, they don't hurt anything but that. And they only basically are affected on uh, uh, the insects that are eating your plants. And it's only basically insects that they affect. So it's safe for humans to eat that leaf even. So this is where science and technology is kind of stepping up for organic farming. And I hear these podcasts that I'll mention later that are just fantastic in the States, but I'm scouring the websites and the home centers in Japan and Amazon trying to find these things that just aren't available. So fortunately, like I said, there is BT and there is neem oil, but it's super expensive, but it's worth it because as an organic farmer, yeah, that's, that's the big burden of the organic farmers the bugs <laughs> they're coming they're coming for you but if i can just say one other thing is prevention of the bugs is huge so i've learned over the past five years that floating row cover so basically if you can imagine that this is your 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 bed your your garden bed and your plants are growing up it you put a hoop a half hoop half circle in the ground hoop and then you cover that with a net and then that runs the length of your whole bed, insects can't get in. And that's how I protect my cabbages, my broccolis, my cauliflowers, and things like that, the brassicas, against the cabbage moth, because they are devastating. I mean, these hornworm caterpillars are bad, but no. It's like, those are like the little guys. I mean, these cabbage moth butterflies, whoo, they're the mafia. They come in and they take over and they will just eat everything. So there's a lot of different things out there um, that are organic that you can look up online and people say this is okay to use because it only basically affects these things. Um, so I think that's what I would recommend the most. Makes sense. Um, and actually you were mentioning earlier like the population of uh, farmers in Japan decreasing and I was watching your talk with uh, Joy from Sustainability, Sustainability Live and uh, I was interested oh, yeah. in what you were saying about self-sufficiency uh, in, in, in Japan, like food self-sufficiency. Can you tell us a mm. bit more about that? Mm. Um, for all the Japanese people listening, I, uh, or people in Japan listening, uh, please pay close attention because I've found that a lot of people don't know this. And actually, I didn't know this until I did research for a talk I was given about four years ago. The self-sufficiency uh, number in Japan right now is below 40%. Wow, 40%, below 40%. And they do that not on a food basis, but on a caloric basis. Because if Japan were to go back right now to eating rice, vegetables, and a little bit of seafood like they used to till about 100 years ago or so, we would be almost 100%. We would be between 90 and 100% just right now. But because we eat so much wheat, because we eat so much meat, um, those two things are what put us way, way, way below. Now, you must say, but there are a lot of chickens, pigs, and cows are raised in Japan. What do they eat? I mean, you have to have, let's say a cow weighs 1,000 pounds. It doesn't, but let's say it weighs, a thousand, uh, you know, 400 kilograms. Maybe it does, actually. I don't know how much a cow weighs. But you're going to feed that cow maybe three or four times that much food in its lifetime. So you have to bring in, you know, let's say 2,000 kilograms of food for one cow. That food does not come from Japan. That food is imported. And it's usually GMO corn and soy. So all that is imported. That's where we really go below self-sufficiency. Um, so I think that's an important statistic. So people can remember that when they choose their food. If you want to support the environment, if you want to support sustainability, eat less meat eat less wheat. That's it. So I've gone off meat and I eat very little wheat these days. Um, and it's not that bad. It's actually very healthy and I love my food still. So I'm not missing out on anything. People say, well, don't you want a cheeseburger? No. You know, I mean, when I think about the impact of that cheeseburger and not only on my colon, but on the environment, no, I actually don't want a cheeseburger, much less a, a panda burger. You know, I mean, that's what I think. It's like, would you eat a panda burger or a human burger? No, those things may taste great, but you just wouldn't eat it, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cerebral decision, you know? 
So there are ways for people to, to help that statistic by eating more local organic vegetables and rice. So that's yeah. easy enough. And to go back to uh, your farming philosophy, um, mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit more about the different types of uh, selling channels for farmers mm. in Japan and the one you have chosen? Hmm. which is quite yeah. traditional. Um, I yeah, I, again, I'm not a trained farmer. I'm not a professional, so I can't speak about this as a professional. But from my, my experience, I've learned that there are certain farmers who grow one thing, like a carrot farmer. We only grow carrots, don't come here for lettuce. And that's fine. And they sell mainly to wholesales and, and supermarkets and things like that. And that's a great business. They can be organic or conventional. And then there's people who grow for markets, like um, wholesale markets, and they may grow 10 to 100 different things. And there's people who grow for restaurants. They're dedicated to restaurants. Um, I grow for direct to customer, what's called a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture System. Uh, in Japan, it's called the Teike. And it's an ancient system. It's the first system. I mean, everybody used to just know their farmer and just like they know their, you know, carpenter, they know their builder, they know their, you know, their, their meat guy, you know, the cow farmer too, because we didn't have supermarkets, we didn't have markets, we just had people. So this is the oldest system of selling vegetables is people subscribe, they give me money in advance, and then I give them, you know, vegetables, mix of whatever I have that day. So today I harvested, let's see, we've got carrots, we've got beets, we got cucumbers, we got eggplant or aubergine, we had okra, we had peppers of several different varieties, we had uh, zucchini and uh, summer squash, we had some tomatoes, some beans, some herbs, and that all just went into a basket and I washed it and delivered it directly to them in a basket without any plastic packaging, no refrigeration, uh, no extra water usage because I use mountain water, fresh as you can be, here you go. And I think that's the most sustainable system there is for a small organic farmer who has time to deliver themselves. Now, some people actually come to my house and pick up the vegetables. See, I, I farm up in the mountains of Shiga and an hour and 10 minutes away, I live in Kyoto City. So on my way back, I do my deliveries. So on the way back home today, I spend an extra 15 minutes delivering to my three customers today. But it might be as many as 10 customers in a day. It just depends on the day and the season. So that's the best way to get your food the most sustainably is direct farm to table. Yeah. I like your uh, zero impact philosophy, even in the way you wash or you keep your vegetables cool with the river. I think <laughs> that's river, really clever. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It feels good too. It feels good too. Mm. Um, there's a question actually about uh, how do you produce your, own, your, your seeds? Like, do you produce your own seeds or do you buy them? I do a mixture of things. Um, like I said, I'm not a professional farmer, so I make loads of mistakes every year. So sometimes I have to run to the home center and buy starts, which is, you know, baby plants. Um, so they may be hybrids, you know, half ones. So I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfectly sustainable farmer, but I do what I can to try to get heirloom seeds and grow them myself. Um, but I grow 50 or 60 varieties of vegetables. And of those varieties, sometimes I grow 10 or 15 different kinds of each one. Like lettuces, I grow so many kinds of lettuce, you wouldn't believe it. And beans, so many kinds. And, you know, beets, six kinds of beets, you know, four kinds of carrots and 10 kinds of radishes, you know, just all these different kinds of different varieties. So I, I have trouble keeping up with everything. And I'm basically on the, the learning curve of what grows the best and what's the most sustainable and easy to grow so that uh, the bugs leave it alone or the weather is suitable and my soil is suitable or the weather you know, the watering and da, 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 da. so I'm still on the learning curve so I'm still figuring it out but I do what I can to save seeds but I'm really just in the winter squash realm right now with you know big kabocha and butternuts and blue hubbards and spaghetti squash easy to save seeds right just so anybody can do it it's just spit the seed on your plate let it sit for a couple of days put it in a bag you know, but saving seeds is the best way to go because you say you save your biggest butternut squash and you take, keep those seeds. I've been doing this for five years and you save those seeds and you plant those out the next year and the next year you save your biggest one. And suddenly your butternuts are great. They're fantastic because they're, they're the ones that do best in your system. 
So I really recommend seed saving for anyone who has time, but I tell you right now, seed saving can be a full time job if you want to do it for several varieties. So yeah, try to get seeds off a of carrot or cucumber. You have to wait a couple of years, you know, so it's not something I've been able to incorporate completely in my system, but something that I'd like to. So. Um, there's an interesting question actually, which is the, do you think organic farming or permaculture could be scaled and normalized or is there limitations? I can't speak about permaculture. Again, I barely know how to farm and I, I aspire to learn about permaculture, but again, right now I'm still on just the curve of just vegetables, man. Let me see if I can just get some vegetables and I compost and I do use some manures that I get locally sourced, but I am not at permaculture yet. I don't live at my farm, so I can't even have chickens, which I'd love to have chickens. I'd love to have chickens and goats and dogs to chase those monkeys away. But <laughs> I, I, don't I don't live there, so I, I can't have these things yet. Um, so that's maybe something in my future. But as far as scaling organic farming, I'm doing that. I mean, I'm growing on such a small area in the mountains without any experience, and it's totally taken me over. Am I making a lot of money doing it? Uh, no. So if you're looking for that, I'm afraid you're going to have to find a new formula. But if you're looking for a real sort of sense of purpose and accomplishment and a synergy with, with the environment, uh, a respect for yourself, your body, the environment, and the whole process of watching it from seed to table, and that being enough, then yes, you can do it on your apartment balcony to in a community garden or renting a plot or moving out to the country. It's completely scalable. And I recommend people try to do it themselves. Just like the fish you catch in the ocean, just like the mountain you climb to see the sunset, just like the tomato you grow in your container yourself, there's nothing better. There's nothing more rewarding and it'll never taste as good unless you do it yourself. Mm. And do you think actually that organic farming um, is becoming more popular in Japan? Like, I mean, buying organic from... Uh... Yes, yes, it is. Um, the Kyoto Co-op now has an organic section and will deliver only organic stuff. There are more kind of sort of co-op sort of businesses getting started where people are getting organic vegetables from the countryside. Again, I'm able to deliver myself because it's in my formula. I live in Kyoto. I have to come back anyway. Mm. A lot of people live out in the country and can't do that. So the, some of these companies have started up where they, you know, they make the rounds in their truck. And I want to give a shout out to KOA, Kyoto Organic Action. They're doing an awesome job of doing that. Um, Kentaro Suzuki, I suggest anybody in the Kansai Kyoto area to look them up. They're fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is people taking it up now and there are people who are recognizing the importance of it. And I got to tell you, I really have to tell you, everybody at home, go buy an organic something and then go buy a non-organic something and close your eyes and take a bite. And you tell me, really, you tell me what's the difference. It's not some esoteric idea. It's flavor, man. It's, it's the flavor you're missing. And not only that, it's the nutrient level. I mean, why do you think we evolve with taste buds? So we know what a fine wine tastes like or the rare cheesecake? No, it's because our body can tell us what our body needs iron. We can taste iron in this. We're going to keep eating this. Haven't you had that personal experience where you're eating a salad after a couple of days? Like, oh my God, I ate that whole salad. I couldn't believe it. That's what your body wanted, you know? That's where our taste buds have evolved. In my mind, it's you can taste the nutrients in it. And that's why organic vegetables taste better because they have more nutrients in them. I mean, this is science. This isn't my opinion. But the taste bud thing is kind of my own idea. But <laughs> I really think it's true. Go out there and taste for yourself. I really recommend that. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another question. So... Like, why, why is Japan so late with their organic farming? Mm. Mm. I don't know the full answer to that. Mm. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that um, the Japanese society had a reset button after World War II. And I think uh, they really got ahead of the game with a lot of things. I think cell phones were here really much more popular here than they were in a lot of countries. 
but on that upward tick, I mean, they went for a very highly agricultural, simple society to a very technologically advanced society in a very quick time. They kind of cut ties with that old life. So maybe that's why, you know, they kind of said, no, that's the old way. We don't want the old way. We want the convenience store. You know, we want the, you know, the McDonald's. We want the Domino's pizza. We want, you know, the stuff that everybody else all over the world is enjoying. We don't want to remember, oh yeah, we have to eat, you know, seasonal food, local, yeah, 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 yeah. No, we want the coffee from Brazil like everybody else is drinking, you know? So I think it was just a sort of societal thing, but I am not sure. Um, I do know that Japanese people are very close to their food traditionally, and I think there's a great capacity in them to be able to appreciate it. Um, and I know a lot too. When when people do eat my vegetables, they're like, "Oh, mm. that's good." And my my wife is Japanese, and her mother is a farmer, and she's eaten my daikon, and she's grown daikon for fifty or sixty years. And she said, "Chuck, your daikon's good," and I melted because uh, that's the highest compliment I have ever got from <laughs> from another farmer. So because her daikon are fantastic, so it's 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 great when people taste it and experience it for themselves mm -hmm. you know if you want to support an organic farmer all you have to do is buy organic mm -hmm. and you'll feel it's not like tomorrow you'll wake up and be like i'm cured of all my diseases and i'm healthy and thin oh my god it's it's more than that it's a deeper sort of experience but at the time you eat it you will you will probably taste it and you'll probably feel it's different mm -hmm. so yeah. I feel uh, sometimes there's a barrier, especially in Japan, uh, in terms of the price difference between organic and conventional uh, products. Mm -hmm. Do you know why there's such a huge difference? Yeah, yeah. well, I go back to the bugs, you know. You plant, <laughs> you plant 200 cabbages and you spray them with chemicals, you'll get those 200 cabbages, you know, you will. That's why you spray them with chemicals. You don't spray them with chemicals, you might get 20 if you don't take care of them. Maybe 20 uh, because the, the bugs will get them all. So you have to use these organic means, which are more labor intensive, harder to find, more expensive, and less effective. That's why. So if you want to eat an organic cabbage, you should pay double for it because the person has worked more than twice as hard for it and earns that money because... Let me tell you, cabbage in the ground for three or four months that just about everything that walks on this earth wants to eat, and you can save it for a human, that's pretty good. Those are <laughs> warriors out there. Those aren't farmers. Those are the front line, I got to tell you. <laughs> nice. So uh, actually, we are reaching uh, the end very soon. I wanted to ask hmm. you uh, one last uh, question, which is... Uh, what resources uh, would you recommend on uh, ecology or organic farming for people to uh, look into? The things that have impacted me the most um, have been personal experience. Um, I would really recommend somebody just to, first of all, don't give up. You're going to fail. Don't give up. But second of all, try. Try. Go get a container. Go get a baby plant or some seeds and just do it. And don't forget to water it. You know, and if you forget to water it, don't beat yourself up about it. Just do it again. There's m more plants for sale. You know, just try it. Try it, try it, try it. If you've got a little piece of ground, do it. Just remember to water them. You know, really, water, forgetting to watering is probably the number one mistake. And you'll get something you know, and you'll have a personal experience with it. Don't do it for the food, do it for the process. It's not an end game sort of thing. It's really a sort of journey that you'll be setting yourself up for. And it's wonderful. It's so rewarding. It's so great. You could even just grow flowers, you know, just something like that that's very aesthetic and personal. Um, but if you did want some advice um, in English, I listen to two resources regularly and I tip my hat to both of these people. Um, Chris Blanchard from America runs Farmer to Farmer. Uh, it's a podcast you can find on any sort of podcast streaming. Um, it's over 200 episodes of gold. Um, he interviews people from all over North America um, who are growing all sorts of different things in all sorts of different ways. And each podcast is about an hour and a half long or so. And 
oh, it's amazing. I mean, what that man has done for agriculture in the world, the world owes him a huge debt of gratitude for putting that down. It's now there for everybody to, to, to experience. And the hilarious and very talented and wonderful Mike McGrath from You Bet Your Garden out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. You Bet Your Garden. Look that one up. It's a radio show that he turns into sort of a podcast. And it's a, the kind of radio show where he has a question of the day where he talks about tomatoes or trees or grass or something for 10 minutes. But the rest of the show, people call in and ask questions like, why did my petunias die? Or what do you do for tomatoes? Or how do you get this thing or whatever? And he just answers because he's brilliant and he's hilarious. So it's very, very entertaining, even for no, somebody who knows nothing about anything because it's people who know nothing who are calling in. You know, it's, it's a real beginners friendly sort of show. Whereas the Chris Blanchard is a bit more technically minded, but still easy to listen to and very wonderful. But the Mike McGrath show is just fantastic. So those two things, I hope you can add those in the notes because I will. gold, absolute <laughs> gold. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chuck. There was so many other topics I wanted to talk to you about, but <laughs> you know we are running out of time. So yeah, yeah there's uh, so much you're doing for uh, you know composting. I know, so we didn't get to talk about Seeds of Sustainability Kyoto, but uh, maybe, you know, people don't hesitate to check out the, I think on Facebook, you have a page uh, with um, upcoming events. Um, yeah. Um, and of course, if you want to order vegetables, if you live in Kyoto area, you just get in touch with uh, Chuck on uh, Facebook, if I'm correct. And come out and volunteer, come out for a yes. farm tour, come out and just see what we're doing because there's many more ways to, to get involved. Nice. And I think, is it still going on? But you have regularly some live as well, where every, I think it's on Sundays, um, you show the, the farm and what you're doing as well. So. Well, I, long story short, I got a grant to start a community farm and I've been doing a po uh, like a live broadcast once a month uh, for the community farm. And that's been one Sunday a month. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, you can get that information on Facebook as well. Yeah. Or just send me a message to my website, www.midorifarm.net. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I Thank hope you, you enjoyed so yourselves and learned something. <laughs>